Yes. Can, we can, can hear you. you. Okay. That was a dramatic beginning, the first of the, I'm sure, many other such occasions which will be complicated. Okay, let me start with the text. There are texts that are very familiar to Jews and Christians alike because of their regular use in religious services. Now, one example is the sentence, Kadosh, 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 Adonai Tzavaot, Melol, Chol Haaretz, Kvodo, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. It actually comes from chapter six of the biblical book of Isaiah. The prophet has a vision while standing in the temple. He sees God seated like a king on a raised throne while the skirts of the king's garment fill the temple. Standing around God are fiery heavenly beings, in Hebrew, seraphim, and they are singing praises to God using this particular sentence. There is even a Jewish tradition that during the service, when we chant the threefold kadosh, 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 we rise on our toes as if trying to join with that heavenly choir. Now, though the sentence is familiar, there are questions to be asked about what it actually means, especially if we only know it in translation. For example, what does the English word holy mean? And is it an appropriate translation of the Hebrew kadosh? Its origins, the English origins, can be traced back to the 11th century words found in Saxon and related languages, which mean whole in the sense of complete, uninjured. In the 14th century, it appears in Wycliffe's English translation of the Bible as the word holy, which is then understood as sacred, consecrated, venerated, godly. However, the Hebrew kadosh means something like set apart for a purpose, other, different, separate. When God invites the Jewish people to share this same divine quality, God says to them, Kadoshim tihiyu ki kadosh ani Adonai Eloheichem. As a people, you shall be separate, set apart from other peoples, just as I, the eternal your God, am set apart. In the light, uh, and though uh, despite what Kirsten said earlier, in the light of the impact of the coronavirus, it is hard to resist the temptation to translate the beginning of that verse, Kadoshim Tihiyu, as you shall collectively isolate yourselves. In Isaiah's vision, it is not sufficient for the seraphim merely to say that God is kadosh, other, different. Nor is it simply repeating the word twice enough. Only a third repetition, kadosh, 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 begins to express how that otherness of God is even more and more separate from any human reality. Only that threefold repetition can begin to express how God is beyond knowing, beyond understanding, even beyond human encounter. And here is a diagram to show and to illustrate what I mean by this. Um, it's a, an attempt to indicate um, how kadosh, 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 as it were, moves into ever more distant and separate places. Um, this poetic form asserts that God cannot be contained in any, no, in any concept, experience, or imagining that human beings can express. In today's theological language, we would define this otherness of God by the term transcendence. But that is only the first half of the sentence of the seraphim, because this otherness of God is immediately contrasted in the second part. Melo chol ha'aretz kavodo. The whole earth is full of God's kavod. Again, we are not always helped by our translations. The conventional English translation of kavod is glory. This time, the word comes from Latin and Old French, gloria, which means fame, renown, praise. Yet the Hebrew root of the word kavod speaks about weight, heaviness, physicality, presence. 
Kavod applies to whatever gives someone or something weight in the eyes of others. God's presence is so weighty that there is no space that it does not fill, no, diagram, no place on earth where God's presence cannot be experienced. And here is an attempt to indicate that, Melo Chol Haaretz, and then a very large Kavodo filling the earth. Again, to use a theological term, we are describing God's immanence. So in effect, this apparently simple sentence of the Seraphim contains the great religious paradox. The God is both unknowable and unreachable, yet at the same time, almost physically present in the world. And this is an attempt just to, to show the two, uh, this paradox and the same text together. The terms transcendent and imminent make deliberate distinctions between these two aspects of the divine. They define them as oppositions. But Isaiah's words hold these two realities within a single sentence, intimately tied to one another. God's apparent distance is forever bound to God's intimate presence in the world. But at the same time, God's nearness can never be completely defined or contained or taken for granted. This imagery of God's simultaneous distance and nearness is further reinforced in the first four verses of chapter six of Isaiah. And the key is in the Hebrew word malay, which means to fill. Verse one describes God's throne as being raised up, set apart on high, yet the skirts of God's robe fill the temple, just as God's kavod fills the earth. And in verse four, the outer walls of the building shake, but now the buildings once again fill, but this time with smoke. Like the threefold kadosh, the three repetitions of the verb malay to fill reinforce the same theme of God's otherness yet closeness, distant yet also present, remote yet intimately near. Having set this scene, Isaiah raises the question, how can any human being, even a prophet, build a bridge between these two separate domains, the heavenly and the earthly? He describes his dread at standing directly in the presence of God, for he is merely an impure human being whose very lips are impure. As if to reinforce his inadequacy, he describes himself as living amongst an entire people of unclean lips. And yet the apparent solution is at hand, aided by using the temple imagery. Because now, because now he is standing in the court where the priests officiate and burn incense. In his vision, one of the seraphim, using a pair of tongs, takes a hot coal from the incense altar and touches it to Isaiah's lips, thus purifying them. The use of the tongs dramatizes the need of the pure seraph to distance himself from the impurity of the human being. But now, for the first time, Isaiah has access to the heavenly domain. He stands unharmed in the presence of God and can address God directly and hear the message that he is to bring to the people. But what he hears is shocking because whatever he says will make no difference. Instead, it will reinforce the unwillingness of the people to obey God's will. Go say to this people, hear and keep on hearing, but do not understand. See and keep on seeing, but do not comprehend. Make fat the heart of this people. Make their ears heavy and seal their eyes, lest seeing with their eyes and hearing with their ears and understanding with their heart, they repent and heal themselves. The very senses of hearing <clears throat> and seeing that the prophet has now acquired for himself will be exactly those which stand in the way of the people 
without the kind of purification that the prophet has had to undergo, the people will never accept the divine word. It is as if by entering the divine domain, he is now effectively closed off from his own world. Isaiah dramatizes the tragic fate of the biblical prophet. The closer he or she comes to God's word, the harder it is to communicate with the very people who need his message. I want to step back from the seeming hopelessness of the picture that Isaiah has drawn of the inherent impossibility of prophecy, because this chapter is exquisitely crafted and is itself a rhetorical act. By expressing so forcefully the very impossibility of people accepting the message that he brings, Isaiah is also challenging them to do the exact opposite, to open their hearts, eyes and ears and turn and repent with the promise of healing. It is an example of a kind of psychological trick, <clears throat> that of paradoxical intention. And I first heard this term uh, from uh, Viktor Frankl, uh, uh, well known as, the, as a psychiatrist. Um, but I then learned that in Germany, there is an equivalent. It's in the footnote for some of you who want to look at the bottom, because there's a well-known uh, in psychological circles in Germany, something called the Schweinisch, the Nordfriesische Schweineschwang Methode. Uh, basically, it says that um, you cannot force a pig to jump into a, a lorry which, to, to drive him away. If you push the pig, it won't move. But if you pull its tail, it jumps forward onto the lorry. So this is paradoxical intention from the point of view of the pig. But apparently, it's a well-known psychological concept. So back to the text. Awed by the prophet's experience, and his amazing narrative skill and the dread hopelessness that he evokes, surely some people will get the message and change. Now in our Bible week, we pay very close attention to the details of the Hebrew text. I want to show one further literary device used by Isaiah. Now don't be scared of this uh, Hebrew text if you don't have any Hebrew. Um, I just want to draw your attention to the colors that um, there is a pink word marked in pink and there's a, another couple of words marked in green. The chapter is divided into three parts, verses one to four, which take place within the innermost part of the temple, the Holy of Holies. The encounter with the seraph is in the chamber where the priests would function. And here the seraph and the prophet can meet. And that's the middle section, verses uh, four to eight, five to eight. And the third and last section, verses nine to 13, deals with the world outside, the land that will become desolate because God has exiled the people from it. Nevertheless, the very end speaks of a small seed of holiness, a zera kodesh, a stump which, from which a new beginning may emerge. And Whereas at the beginning we have threefold in red, I can't mark it, kadosh, 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 at the very end, the last but one word is again kadosh. Now, in each of the three sections, the name of God appears twice, but it is written in one of two different ways. Um, now, in uh, uh, pink, sorry, in the green version, um, um, Sorry, no, okay, start again. Um, yes, yes, yes. One variation is the familiar but unpronounceable yod hey vav hey, which Jewish tradition forbids us to say aloud so that we substitute for it the word Adonai. And Adonai in that text is in pink in those three sections. I'm sorry, sorry, I'll stop. That shows you try to read a text and try to look at the screen at the same time is not, not easy. Um, the yod he vav he is the text in green, um, which appears three times on that page. We will have a short uh, simplified diagram in a moment to see that. But the other way in which the same name is written in this chapter is the actual consonantal form Adonai, Aleph, Dalad, Nun, Yod, here colored in pink. And you can see now on the screen, um, 
the two different names, each of them repeated in the, each of them appearing in each of the three uh, sections of the text. Adonai in pink, Aleph, Dalet, Nun, Yod, and Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey, the Tetragrammaton in green. But though both of these forms appear in each of the three sections of the chapter, they are used in significantly different ways. The consonantal form appears where Isaiah actually sees God in verse one at the very beginning, or hears God in verse eight, or directly addresses God in verse 11. That is to say, it stands for the imminent God whom the prophet can see, hear, and address. But the tetragrammaton is used to designate God as the transcendent being. Twice it is used in the combined form, Lord of hosts, Adonai Tzavahot, signifying the heavenly hosts that serve God. And the third time, it stands alone, but speaks of God's actions in the world, emptying the land of its people. So once again, in all three parts, the transcendent and the imminent are juxtaposed with one another throughout the entire chapter. God is at once intimate, and utterly distant and remote. I am constantly astonished at the sophistication of Isaiah's literary skills and the subtlety of his theological expression. If we accept his understanding, he leaves us with the challenge of building our own bridge between these two domains, these two potential experiences of God, but also finding for ourselves the unity, the oneness that lies behind them. Thank you for your patience and I apologize for the occasional mistake. Wie schon verheißen, gibt es jetzt die Möglichkeit in Kleingruppen ins Gespräch zu kommen über das Gehörte. And uh, as already promised, uh, you now have the opportunity to enter into a discussion, a conversation with others in, uh, in little groups, in small groups, buzz groups. Die werden Uta und Annette, die uns ja heute hosten und auch morgen ähm, zufällig zusammengestellt. And um, these groups, uh, they're actually breakout groups in uh, the language of Zoom. Uh, they, have, they are going to be happening in a random way, but this is being organized nevertheless, the way that you are allocated randomly to the groups. Es sind etwa sechs Personen pro Gruppe angedacht. The idea is that we'll have about six persons in each group. Das heißt, was gleich passiert ist, dass ein kleines Fensterchen auftaucht und ihr bestätigen müsst, dass ihr in diese kleine Gruppe geht, also kurz auf Ja oder Okay oder sowas, was da kommt, drücken. So, what